Welcome to the 16th episode of the Influential Wellnesspreneur podcast. My name is Sebastian Hilbert and I'm the Wellnesspreneur expert. I have wellness business owners to reach the ideal client with an effective online presence. Now, on that journey, I meet incredible people and I feature them every week on this podcast. And today I have Bridget Sigley on, who is the owner of Focus on Living. Hi, Bridget, how are you? Hello. <laughs> Very well, thank you. Awesome. It's so great to have you uh, on this podcast. To everyone who's out there, Bridget, as I said, is the owner of Focus on Living, and she has an incredible um, story. Uh, she had two major um, health crises that she has um, pushed through, and major, I almost think, is a, is a bit of an understatement. I'm not sure she will um, and talk to us a bit more today about that. So she says that's basically her biggest achievement, going through these um, health challenges and today, eight years later, being alive, laugh and love more. Um, with her business, Focus on Living, Bridget helps hundreds of working mothers to feel calm, vibrant and free. Her mission is to empower women to focus on living guilt-free. What a beautiful way of giving back and make the most of what she has been giving. She lets, so let's get right into it. Bridget, I really want to know more, and I'm sure our listeners today as well, they want to know more about these two health challenges that you have been through and how this um, connects and um, builds your story and your why to now um, run your business focus on living. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you'd asked me 10 years ago uh, if I'd be doing what I'm doing, uh, I, I would have said, you're crazy. <laughs> but everyone goes on this journey, right? Um, you know, for me, um, I, was, I was the complete opposite of being calm, vibrant and free. I, um, uh, my, my life was, I used to actually be in corporate and I had a, um, a computing company. Um, <clears throat> And um, when, I, when I had my first health challenge, I was, I think I was 35 and I just, I just started my company and I just had my first child and he was six months old and I just noticed that I had a really stiff neck. Um, and I was like one of those, I don't know if you've ever seen those Thunderbird characters um, years and years ago. They were like, kind of like, puppets but they used to move very slowly the thunderbirds I was like that I could hardly move my neck and my husband said to me at that point he said can you go and do something about that you know you're popping all these um these pills these painkillers all the time and I said look I've been to see various different um specialists and I just think that that's what I have you know and anyway, he, um, so I booked in with this GP and I asked to have an MRI. And you know when you're driving out of the place where they do the MRI and you get a call from the GP and he says, can you pull over? And he said, can you go to the nearest pharmacy and buy blood thinning tablets? And I thought, what's going on? And um, the next morning I find myself at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and they're telling me that I had a tumour the size of a golf ball at the base of my um, brain. Um, <clears throat> and I just, I don't know if it was shock, fear or whatever, but my first reaction was, how quickly can you fix me? You know, I've got a little child to look after. <laughs> You're laughing, yeah. Um, I've got, yeah, I've got work on. Um, I meant to do this great big triathlon next weekend. So my life had been full on go, 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 never, ever stopping. And he said to me, well, we can do the operation, you know, and we'll do the operation we need to in the next 48 hours. Otherwise, you might be paralysed. Um, and so they operated 48 hours later. And they said to me, we want you to rest for the next six weeks. And I thought, I don't need to rest. You know, I can be back out there in two. You know, what would they know anyway? And so it was almost like I was putting um, the accelerator down and just moving on. And it was like this tiny speed hump, right? But I just thought life's for living. I just need to do everything now is the way that I looked at it. 
So, so my company grew and we grew to have, we're in Melbourne, we grew to have offices on St Kilda Road and some big computing clients and I, and I had then had three kids by this stage. So I'm 40. I had three kids and they were all under seven, seven, five and three. Um, I was also fitting into my day um, tr- training for this triathlon, like a, a super long one as well, um, and, and I had a nanny for the kids. And one day I was getting into the shower and I noticed that um, um, it, it was this autumn morning and I was soaping up and I just noticed this lump under my arm and it was like the size of a pea. And it was just this feeling that you know when something's not quite right. I just knew that something wasn't right. I kind of, for a, for a month or so, pretended it wasn't there and eventually I took myself off to the doctor. And the next, the next minute I'm sitting in, in the waiting room of this specialist office filled with these people, women and their husbands, and they're all looking at the ground. You could have cut the air with a knife. You know, it was just so depressing. And I was thinking, what am I doing here? You know, like I've never really thought I've ever been sick and, you know, what's, what's going on? Um, I, I just didn't feel like I, this is, this is supposed to, not supposed to be happening to me. Um, she calls me in to, to the waiting room and it's this very mystically come this way like I'm a naughty little school kid. Um, and I follow her in and she sits me down on one of those those benches that they have or couches, sort of long, long benches and puts the crisp paper over the top. And I sit down and I just feel quite vulnerable at that time. And she delivers the news to me that I have grade three breast cancer and it's on, in all my lymph nodes. And, yeah, and, and I just for moments there I just couldn't say anything and then the thing that came out of my head was how quickly can you fix me again again I've got invoicing due out on Thursday you know I I run this company I'm saying you know I've got three kids um they've all got their activities this just doesn't suit me to happen now right (laughs) I'm cringing as I'm telling you um (laughs) And she says something to me. She says that I'll always forget, forget, remember, um, this is going to be a long journey. And my journey started with six months of chemo and I'll say chemo hell. So um, around one, I was like this boxer and went into it and I said, I can do this. You know, that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to do chemo and I thought, fine. And then by, by round two, I started to lose my hair and my eyebrows. And I didn't really think that I was vain. But when you, um, when you lose those as a woman, um, for me, I started to, to, to people, I could see people could identify then that I was ill. And so it was like, oh, poor Bridget. And so, so um, and, I, and, and for my clients as well, I was worried about what my clients were thinking. And then by round three, I started to forget people's names, like mothers in the playground that I'd known for ages. Um, And then round four, um, I'd always been very good at making a decision. Boom, boom, now we've got to do this and that. And suddenly I couldn't make a decision. Um, Now, during this time, I decided that I would go off to, there's a place in Victoria called the Gawler Cancer Institute. And I thought, I need to kind of feel like I, I'm i doing something for myself. And, and they, taught me about, um, they taught me about meditation and a vegan diet. So I was like regimented. I implemented this, this meditation. I was doing it twice a day, but doing it because I had to. You know, sitting there, I'd never been able to sit there before, and um, and then I I implemented this vegan diet, um, and then I get to round five, and they say, look, your your blood, your immune system is really low. We're going to have to do a blood transfusion. So they did that, 
And by round six, I was like so, so feeling so ill. I couldn't ride my bike up the hill. And, you know, I almost felt like I just, like I was like the walking dead by this stage. And I thought, that's okay, I can get through it. And they they get to the end of round six and I think beauty between them and us, I'll be well, right? So I go back to the the breast surgeon and she delivers me the news that the chemo hasn't worked. And in fact, it's now more aggressive and and spreading than, than it was before. And I was really angry. Like I was angry at because I'd been through all of this and like previously I'd felt so well and I was angry at myself that here I thought I'd been doing everything to help myself and, um, you know, in my eyes it hadn't worked. And I remember coming home from that and going down into my meditation room and just lying on the floor of my meditation room. And it was the first time that I'd actually... I'll call surrendered. So what I mean by that is I lay down and I didn't have the answers as to what to do. And I just lay down there and I asked outside of myself, please help me. I don't know what I should do. Um, And I wasn't religious or anything um, at that time. And I just felt this overwhelming sensation like I was being wrapped in this blanket and that everything would be okay. I just needed to trust and, you know, do what what I was being guided to 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 do. Like to, it was like this feeling to do. And I got up from that, and I just had this feeling that I should go back. And I'd had have, Sebastian. Have you ever had Reiki? No, unfortunately no. not. No, I never had Reiki. No. Okay. Look, I had it once earlier on in that journey and, um, and, and Reiki is like a hands-on um, energy healing that you have um, and you, your clothes, but it works, on, um, it works on energy. And if you go like that, you can feel, when you go like this, you can feel the heat between you. Um, anyway, the first time that I went to that, I, I was really desperate for it to work. And, and when I went back, I rang this Margot up um, who I'd been to see and I said, Margot, they're telling me that I need to have this operation next week. They're going to take the breast, all my lymph nodes, and I'm devastated. Can I come in and see you? Just I need to try and find a way to feel better. Um, Margot said, sure, and she did her thing. And I just, that again, just surrendered and let her do her thing. Um, I went home that night and went to bed and my operation was like in four, four, four days. So they'd done all the tests, right? They'd done all the tests to say that it was in my lymph nodes and everything else. And I, um, I woke up the next morning and I put, and subconsciously like I would always go to my little pea-sized lump under my arm. And I went to put my hand underneath there and I, I was thinking, oh, I can't feel anything. Wonder where, you know, maybe it's moved. Um, And I said to my husband, that's odd. I can't feel the lumps, you know, under my arm. Um, And I said, I wonder if I should have another scan. And he said, look, you know, you do what you think you should do. But we were four days out from from the surgery. So I went back down into my meditation room. And again, I would normally just set the timer, right? And so I, uh, this particular time, I just, before I, I started the timer, I just said to myself, in, in my head, I wonder what I should do. Should I go and, you know, wonder what I should do about my lymph nodes, wonder what I should go and have another scan. Um, and I set the timer and then this gets a little bit woo-woo now, but just before the timer was about to go off, I heard this voice outside of myself say, don't let them take your lymph nodes. And I thought, now I'm going crazy. I'm hearing voices. This is crazy. Um, and I went to my husband and I said, look, I've just heard this voice, this big male voice, don't let, uh, you know, um, um, but I think I'm going crazy. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I didn't go and have another scan and they were wheeling me into the operating theatre. And again, I've just got my eyes shut, just doing my deep breathing exercises, not nothing fancy. Um, and I, um, 
and I hear that voice again, don't don't let them take, you know, don't let them take your lymph nodes. And I thought there's something in it. It's like my inner guidance telling me to do this. Have you ever been in a situation where you've had really strong messages to, to do something or not do something? Uh, it's interesting that you say that. Um, I um, um, practice this kind of spiritual um, meditation, you may want to call it, yes. um, regularly. So I am a strong believer in surrendering um, to everything and you know, train this process of surrendering so you can receive um, guidance. And no matter what you want to call it, you want to call it a higher power, God, whatever it is. But I am a strong believer in that, you know, that you can receive guidance and um, that this, you know, will be guidance that um, will lead you to a, to a positive um, life. So, yes, it's yeah. the short answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, anyway, so um, when I got that, that second message again and it was big right it was like this big booming voice that that um I thought there's something going on here and so they opened the doors to the operating theater and I've got to say something and then there was the people taking my breast that team and then there was another team doing the reconstruction um (laughs) and they're all in their white coats and these bright lights and I just couldn't say anything and I went oh oh and just couldn't say anything so they took the breasts and they took all the lymph nodes and I woke up in intensive care and I was feeling really sorry for myself just in terms of that I was wrapped up like a mummy in all these tubes and everything and and (coughs) all of a sudden down the hallway I my little I could hear my three-year-old daughter's voice coming down the hallway and my parents were bringing her in to see me. And I was starting to get really mad because I I didn't want her to see me like this, like I'd always been this really brave and strong person. And she just looked at me in my eyes and and she said, Hi, Mum. She said, did they take your boob? Did they make you a new one? And I just felt this like overwhelming sense of love for her, you know, this um, and for them. And I knew that I needed to do whatever it took to be well and to find that, you know, that was the most important thing for me. Um, And I also knew I had this really, really certainty that I knew if I just listened how to keep myself well, like it was just this really deep thing anyway um the breast surgeon came around a couple of days later and she's going right okay we've done this we're going to now put you into hormone replacement therapy we're going to do radiation blah 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 you know it's it was this really serious the icing on the cake and I said and I don't even know where it came from I said it wasn't in my lymph nodes and she like looked at me like what and I said, it wasn't there. And she said, well, we get the biopsy back of all the lymph nodes, you know. Um, um, and um, and it came back and guess what? It wasn't there. No, it wasn't there. It wasn't there. So, and and I tell people that, that story and, and, you know, sometimes when I speak on stage, they go, oh, my God, they took your breast and, you know, and then it wasn't there. And I think, and I say to people, like, for me, That was my first real experience of really strong messages coming through and me not trusting them. And so so the funny thing about that, after that, I had to lie in hospital still for 12 days, like I couldn't move, which was very unlike me. And And I thought about all the times in my life that when I had become, you know, um, um, ill um um like well I wasn't I used to just be busy all the time and had no body awareness at all Mm. so if ever I was tired I would take a supplement um to to, or or have a coffee or a wine or whatever so there were all these things that I kind of realized about myself that that um I'd been doing and I realized too that if I just 
took responsibility of my health, then you know I could um, I, and and took on my own health that as as like my kind of my greatest project that I could be well. So that was eight years ago. Wow. Mm. Amazing. So, yeah, I find yeah. it I find it incredible that um, you know what you say. It's like um, you got basically hit by two big hammers, right? Until you you started to realize. Okay. And on one side, I like I, I pull my head. You know what you've done, been through there, and how you have handled it. Um, because I think that's that's a beautiful way of handling it to so actually take in your your mind not just you know the physical body and help you to resolve this major issue and i always say um you know the, the universe will always um guide you and it will start with giving you little nudges to put you yeah. in the right direction right and if you don't listen to it if you suppress it it will come to the point when it hits a big hammer and if you then ignore it again it will do it again and again and again I know you either. And you might end up dead, mightn't you? If you well, either you act up on it, or you may end up dead, or at least not a, a hard, a hard, um, a hard life. So um, it happened to me when I was um, when I was eighteen. Um, I didn't listen to the to, to the universe, or whatever you want to call it, to go out and and take uh, responsibility for my life and and make changes. And in 2008, my grandfather died on cancer. I dropped out of uni and I had a car accident, which almost cost my life and the life of my best friend. So, and then when I changed. And at the mm. end of my study, um, about four or five years later, um, I was on the way of becoming a GM. That's what was my dream, a general manager of a big hotel. And then all of a sudden the universe started to nudge me again. So like, is it really the right way for you? Shouldn't you do something else? Shouldn't you maybe be, um, do, do something on your own? And that time I listened and I thrived again. So I believe whenever you can receive something, you listen to it and you act up on it, that's the most important part, then you will actually thrive. And I feel like you experienced something similar. Very yeah, similar. Yeah. yeah, well, I am... Um... So it was kind of like I gave myself the permission after, you know, after that second instant. And I guess we all need to have like a big catalyst to do something. And in my case, um, like that carrot and the stick thing, mine was I want to be here for my family and, um, and I really want to do that. And I realised that all this time that I had been not taking responsibility for myself and I also realised that I had caused my, um, my illnesses. Um, and what I mean by that is that while I was lying there, I kind of realised that I had operated at this really high adrenaline level my whole life, life like busy, busy, busy. Um, let where, me mask do you think, where do you think that came from, this, like, constant, you know, push, 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 push? Ah, uh, oh. We could, well, I probably need therapy for that. But I think, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I think that I had deemed success was how how quickly I could get ahead. And, you know, um, growing up, we didn't have a lot. And so I wanted, uh, I, I wanted to, to have more and not worry about money and things like that. So, um, and I'd, I'd always be, I describe myself as, um, I'm quite an A-type personality, so that that being determined it used to be at all costs. But I kind of I realised that with my job, although with my company, I thought that I'd enjoyed it. I was operating at a really high stress level, adrenaline all the time. Waking up in the middle of the night, making lists, thinking about things, worrying about stuff. Um, Panadols in my pocket for that afternoon headache and when I stopped with all of that I thought oh my god you know that really stresses me out and so my whole my cortisol levels were all um, completely out of whack and when that happens like when that build build ups on, on a constant basis it then affects your um, immune system and eventually you know in my case that it can lead to um, um, you know, disease and illness. 
So I guess that for me, that taking responsibility to go, okay, well, if I'm responsible and that I got myself into this place, what do I need to do? So, so with people now, I do the same thing. So, um, you know, when, and that's how I came to start focus on living school because I, I got, got out of like you did what I, what I did work wise. I'm just looking, I know that's okay. I'm looking at my battery life. That's okay. It's all right. Can you see that on your screen or no? Uh, Okay. All good. All right. Um, um, so, uh, so I realized that my work that I needed to change what I did work wise and that was a really big step because it kind of, you know, it gave us an income. It was helping paying our mortgage. We had kids and stuff. But I also realized that the most important thing was my health and my well-being. Um, I, also, I also came to understand that although I'd achieved all these material things, it had never really been enough. And even with my sport, I would do something and then go, oh, yeah, but I could do a better time next time. Or, um, oh, you know, if my hair was just a bit longer, then I'd be happier. So it was always this this almost this hamster on a wheel type of thing, you know. And so I needed to kind of get my thoughts um, under control and let some stuff go. Yeah, so, so... This whole journey I went on and I went on it for about four years and changed everything and then thought, oh, my God, I feel so amazing. Like we're eight years later. I need to show other people how to do that, you know, and I've, I've in terms of my health, I'm, I, I've been really well and I know how to keep myself in balance. So, so I created Focus on Living School and at that point in time I wasn't qualified. So... So the way I created it was to have different experts and I kind of, I knew what I wanted to have in it because for most people it's that um, after, after they've been through an hour, uh, you know, how do they actually get still enough to be able to listen to their body? So, so we have in there, uh, there's a, um, a meditation module in there and there's a meditation teacher that takes that. And then there's the first module is all, all about owning uh, up and taking responsibility for your health crisis, and those that don't really want to take responsibility, that 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 deny that their lifestyle, their thoughts had anything to do with it, um, they don't tend to want to work with me. You know, like one of my best client, well, one of a client that I, I remember so well going through the program was this lady Claire, and she'd had a um, uh, she'd had a stroke, and she'd a type personality working really hard had been at work and had a stroke and she said to me it was only through going through the program that she realized and that she didn't want to go back to her old life anymore because that's what had caused her illness that she wanted to move forward um and you know now she feels really grateful for the time she has with her family and her children and 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 works in a different way to what that was and that has a whole bunch of more meaning than um, than just getting to that end destination as fast as possible. Um, so, 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 yeah. So, um, in in terms of the program, it, it's all about reconnecting in with yourself through through getting ways to get still and 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 for for people that have never done that before, it's like scheduling it in and. And then there's rebalancing. So looking at in your life what's out of balance um, and what's perhaps not been working and, and what can you change. So in that section there's there's a section about letting go of, of um, emotions that we're hanging on to past things that have happened because we can't change them. And there's also um, in there um, looking at your food as well, um, you know, is 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 the food how can we change what we eat so that it makes us kind of feel more vibrant um and then the last the last part of the program is all about um reigniting you so finding stuff in your life that you're really passionate about and adding it in and it's interesting i find with me that when i'm doing things 
so I used to work and 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 tick that off and you, that used to be me but now I um add a whole bunch of stuff in you know like I I don't I kind of do a triathlon every now and then but I love hiking like that's this weekend we're off to New Zealand to do a a, a trail hike with my brother for his 50th um and so hiking in nature and I've got a stand-up paddleboard that I'm just getting some lessons on how to ride it in waves. So, so having those those other things in your life that you're passionate about helps to lift your um, um, your happy hormones and also your creativity. I find that I'm a lot more creative with with my business because of that. Yeah, very much so. I think that's um, that's what I experienced um, as well. It's it's when you and come to this point where you actually nurture yourself, um, all of a sudden you come up with ideas to actually make your business grow and um, or, or change or whatever it is. You may just want to change instead of grow, um, which is, you know, fine as well. And really that, that space and that fun that you have whilst you're doing whatever you're doing and really enjoying the... the um, the, the the pathway and not so much just aiming for that seeing seeing everything as a means to an end and aiming for the destination what you just explained with claire mm-hmm. what she kind of was doing like and I, and I i know i've been doing that a lot and i still you know have to remind myself to not do it and really and um, getting in and that's about getting in touch with yourself and and surrender and, and, and get gardens and then and find this space where you can do more with less really isn't it yeah yeah so so it's been an interesting ride with the business because I would have never thought that um, I've, I've just trusted. So I felt really guided to, to so focus on living as an online um, school with various different expert, experts mm. um, and, and my experiences all in kind of short modules and then we do like Zoom type meetings. Um, so I created it. And but but at that point in time, it was about serving people so that they had they had some tools to be able to take responsibility for themselves and can really feel empowered rather than disempowered with how you feel when um, you know how you can often feel when you are going through the medical profession. You kind of um, the med- you just feel like stuff's being done to you, but. There's not a lot you actually can do for yourself at that point in time, so that's why I created it to help to help to be able to um, offer people both. Um, but at the but at the time, and I guess I'm still um, I'm still working with this that it's it's a love and it's a passion. So um, you know, if you said to me, does it generate the same sort of income as your computing company, and does it have reoccurring revenue and all that sort of stuff? No, it doesn't. Um, but it's a love and I love seeing people come out the other side, just really loving their life. So it's awesome to hear um, what you've been through and um, what program you've created, um, Bridget. Uh, I think that's, <laughs> that, that's really something. And yes, I think just because something is not pulling it, the money that you um, uh, maybe, you know, a, a huge amount of money, and giving back and having something that helps people in such a beautiful way, I think is a much more valuable and probably a fulfilling. So what I'm really interested in, and I'm sure um, the audience as well, is for that business, for that wellness business, um, what, it, what it is, and what has really worked for you. And I usually ask for the three, uh, the three best tips for wellness business owners to grow their businesses and, or create their, their business, their lifestyle business and, and giving back and, and creating something similar what you have done. So yeah. if you have free um, tips um, for, for, uh, for see, to explain what has worked for you, that would be great. All right. Uh, so, so the first one is just being authentic. Um, <clears throat> And what I mean by that is just being you and not comparing yourself to other people and and letting them see you. So um, I will do Facebook Lives, but I might be on a paddleboard or something or um, 
with my kids. Uh, so, so just being authentically you is, is, is really important um, to, to build connection. Um, for me, what, what, in terms of getting clients, what's really worked is telling my story. So uh, we all have, have a story and a journey of how we came to do something. And, and I guess it's your why, isn't it, really? Um, but telling my story to people tend, um, is, is a bigger connector because then they, those that have been through a similar journey can relate to it. So I would say wherever you can, be able to tell your story. And like today was kind of a long, long-winded part of it, but um, getting an opportunity. So, so I have, uh, I will um, often um, contact various associations and chiropractors and see if I can come and talk, talk about my journey and, and, the, and the messages that I, um, you know, that are, that, I, I chose to ignore for such a long time and then how I turned that all around. Um, and so, so, yeah, that's speaking. And I guess as part of that speaking, looking at partnering with others that have like-minded type of clients that you're on a similar journey, but perhaps you're not doing quite the same stuff. So they have the clients that you need. So I know that my clients are um, suffering superwomen and suffering supermen. So they've kind of been that, that, that person that does everything um, and maybe they've enjoyed it for a long time but it's not working for them. So it's come out in some sort of health challenge. So, so it's looking at who else has that client base and, and being able to partner with them to be able to get in front of their organ audiences. Um, and my... Um, um, my final, um, oh, there's somebody, I think there's somebody might be uh, mowing their lawns or something with a really, with a really kind of loud lawnmower. Yeah, so I, so I had be authentic, um, so I guess I had speaking, um, authentic, um, and look, um, the last thing is sometimes we can proc procrastinate with stuff go, oh, it's not perfect, you know, I can't put that out there yet. Um, I'm finding now the more I can just get stuff out and not worry about um, whether it works or whether it not works because we're going to make mistakes along the way. And believe me, with this, I've made plenty. Um, and it's still growing, growing. And it takes time. It kind of really takes time to grow a presence and a profile online um, anyway, but just getting out and, and doing it even before it's perfect. Very good. Yeah. That's, I think that I always say a prolific beats perfect. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's so important to just get started. You will now be ready. Yeah. 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 Like some people are, I will come back on my, um, I, I use MailChimp to, to send out, um, news newsletters and stuff uh and um and i'll sometimes i'll have a spelling mistake or something in there and i'll get someone go oh you know that was spelled incorrectly or whatever but but sometimes it's just i'd rather get it out there than to sit on it for a few more days um if it's, if it's come to me yeah 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 it, it's it's so true and i, I think um um, first of all, it's just some great tips now. That's what uh, um, I would also recommend, and to anyone, especially their speaking and partners. I think that's um, especially for early stage business that can really make a massive difference to just train yourself also and getting you know how you to tell your message, how you, how you what language do you use to um, express what you do. Um, mm -hmm. So important and needs training. Do you have? Um, a process when you try to reach um, partners or you try to reach out to your chiropractors or, or other partners do you have a process that you follow or is it more like an um, a, a, well look um, look it's interesting um, so if I've worked with one or two I'll say to them <coughs> I've I've been and, and spoken here and um, and this is because they're all about helping their patients, right? And helping their patients to take more action rather than just 
um, <clears throat> you know, um, being being fixed with them, but never going further than that. So, so I'll tell them about some of the successes. When I'm going into a new one, it's kind of really looking at uh, um, their websites and the association's websites to look at what is their mission statements and 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 what do they do there. So, for instance, I um I've partnered with the Australian Patient Association. So. They, they have me on their website and they're on my website. And, um, and so from time to time, they will um, send, send me, um, um, refer people to me. Mm. Mm. Perfect. Very good. Well, look, Bridget, that was um, awesome to have you here today. And um, what a fabulous story. I really loved um, um, listening to you um, telling your story and also the, how you then turned it into a program to help other people um, find this joy and calmness and, 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 and vibrancy in their lives. So that was really, really amazing. So thank you so much for um, doing this today. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. <laughs> My absolute pleasure. Um, and I, I can, I'd like to share it as well with, so if people want to contact me, um, you know, I'm more than happy to, if, if you have any questions of me, uh, even from a business perspective or something, I'm happy to answer anything as well. So um, Bridget at focusonliving.com.au. Very good. And um, we will also have um, your website and, and that email in, in the podcast show notes. So um, we'll be all there for people to contact you. And I, I strongly recommend it also to everyone because... Um, her web, uh, Bridget's website is really something. I really liked it. And I think she really does um, what you're supposed to do online to um, get some really personal pictures of yourself up there. And, um, you know, going back to, to your first tip, Bridget, um, the, um, be authentic, I think really starts with um, just get some pictures taken of yourself and to show you in situ and um, show who you are with your family. You have a gorgeous picture of your, with you and your family on your contact page. Uh, such a cool idea. Um, you have um, pictures of you and your your part and your team, um, so that, that that that's really great. And I think that's a fantastic starting point to uh, when it comes to a website in general. So I encourage everyone to to um, jump over there um, on focusonliving.com and and have a look at it and what Bridget does and uh, what a really authentic and personal website can look like. Otherwise, I invite everyone to subscribe to the podcast and we see us all next week again. I say tschüss and see you all next time. Bye. If you would like to find out more about what Bridget does, head to www.focusonliving.com.au. The website link along with Bridget's social links are in the show notes, so check them out. Don't forget to subscribe to the Influential Wellness Printer podcast so you don't miss an episode and get involved in our social community. We look forward to seeing you next week when we interview our next inspiring wellnesspreneur. Until then, have fun.